There is a divine discontent within the heart of man, buried deep in time and space. There is a sense of incompleteness, a nagging feeling that we can be more than we currently are. That heart yearns for wholeness, completeness, fullness, that perhaps can never be attained on this plane of existence, but yet feels more real than any pain or pleasure. The whole idea of health is wrapped up in this feeling of wholeness, in the quest for immersion and transcendence. Therefore, health seen in the broadest of terms, as Shoba told us at the beginning, has a spiritual as well as a physical dimension, because health is not only wholeness, but also harmony and balance. What is a healthy body? What is the benchmark? There are degrees of health, and it is difficult to find the top end of the chart of physical health. Ask Jack LaLanne, who once towed 70 small boats tied together with one person in each boat across a several, several mile stretch of the San Francisco Bay in 1961. He's the man after which the exercise, the jumping jack was named. But there are limits to what we can do with the health of our bodies. The larger point is we rarely come close to that potential. But more importantly, how much more significant would it be to reach for the potential health of the mind and heart whose top end is infinite? We live at a time of pervasive illness. Health is an elusive goal for so many. Not only are we plagued with obesity and malnutrition, drug and alcohol abuse, diabetes and heart disease and the like, but also pervasive mental illness, depression, and loneliness. Like al alcoholism, hardly a family is untouched by chronic depression of some order by some of its members. You might say, as the great, te great teachers have said before us, it is time theosophical therapeutics enter the arena. A healthy human body is both strong and flexible. It has a mighty system of defense in the immune system to protect it from incursions of disease and viruses. When properly trained, it has a particular powerful posture, which by the way, Dr. Rich exemplifies par excellence. Whenever you come into his office, all of a sudden you sit up straight and stand up straight. It has significant endurance surprising agility and coordination. If the body is given pure food, ample water, proper exercise, and exposure to the elements, it is a biological marvel of over four billion cells working in concert. The healthy body gets intermittent rest and adequate sleep. It breathes deeply, charging the respiratory system with life-giving oxygen. It has efficient system of ingestion, digestion, and elimination. The human body is not only a medical marvel, but it is an engineering, chemical, and biological marvel as well. If we did not take it for granted so often, we might say it is a miracle in nature, and certainly a mystery with divine origins. In theosophy, man is sevenfold, a being that occupies seven planes of existence, if you will, each one more causal than the next. The physical body, in all its glory, is the lowest and least cause of all the vestures. How much care and concern do we give to all the other vestures, buddhic, monastic, comic, pranic, and astral? The average human being perhaps knows very little about these vital principles, little less how to care for them. In the wisdom traditions of the ancient past, mighty cultures in India, China, Polynesia, Africa, and every corner of the globe, the health of the mind and the soul and all its adjacent vestures stood at the center of what modern men now call spirituality. The quest for enlightenment the quest for balance and wisdom in human life can be looked at as a quest to restore health in every facet of the word. 
The ancient symbol of the caduceus, adopted by modern medicine, represents esoteric truths about the foundations of the universe and man. The secret doctrine of H.P. Blavatsky states, Sorry, from the secret doctrine, chemical science is now compelled by the very force of things to accept even our illustration of the evolution of the gods and atoms, so suggestively and undeniably figured in the caduceus of Mercury, the god of wisdom, and in the allegorical language of the archaic says, sages says a commentary in the esoteric doctrine. The trunk of the Ashvata, the tree of life and being, the rod of the caduceus, grows from and descends at every beginning, every new manvantara, from the two dark wings of the swan, hamsa of life. The two serpents, the ever-living and its illusion, spirit and matter, whose two heads grow from the one head between the wings, descend along the trunk, interlaced in close embrace. The two tails join on earth, the manifested universe, into one. And this is the great illusion, Olanu. Everyone knows what the caduceus is, already modified by the Greeks. The original symbol with the triple head of the serpent became altered into a rod with a knob, and the two lower heads were separated, thus disfiguring somewhat the original meaning. Yet it is as good an illustration as can be for our purpose. This liar rod entwined by two serpents. Verily, the wonderful powers of the magic caduceus were sung by all the ancient poets with a very good reason for those who understand, understood the secret meaning. Secret Doctrine, Volume 1, pages 549 to 550. The ancient Greeks coined the phrase, <clears throat> man is the microcosm of the macrocosm. Man in this sense is not merely name and form, but rather a universal ray of consciousness threading its way through a series of vestures that operate on more or less abstract planes than the physical. The very word man comes from the ancient Sanskrit word manas, meaning the thinker. When we think about health in regards to the entirety of man's constitution, we can easily see a level of depth and profundity that matches and exceeds the wonder of the four trillion cells of the human body working in concert through a wide variety of systems respiratory, digestive, nervous, endocrine, skeletal, lymphatic, cardiovascular, and muscular. Moreover, from the standpoint of esoteric science, the human body is a profound set of symbols representing systems and vestures on interior planes of being. If we make the assumption that our origins are divine, our highest nature is immortal, then it must be also wise, beautiful, and imbued with love. This higher nature is described this way in the Bhagavad Gita, the Song of the Lord. From the Bhagavad Gita, chapter 2. As a man throweth away old garments and putteth on new, even so the dweller in the body, having quitted its old mortal frames, entereth into others which are new. The weapon divideth it not, the fire burneth it not, the water corrupteth it not, the wind drieth it not away. 
for it is indivisible, inconsumable, incorruptible, and is not to be dried away. It is eternal, universal, permanent, immovable. It is invisible, inconceivable, and unalterable. Therefore, knowing it to be thus, thou shouldst not grieve, Krishna. And in that statement, we can see one of the points that Dr. Rich was making about needless fear. If we know in our heart of hearts that we are that immortal soul, we have nothing to fear, as he mentioned earlier. Man is a ray of universal consciousness, threading its way through the most abstract planes down to the most material. To the student unfamiliar with ancient wisdom and theosophia, the question naturally arises. If our nature is divine, then how do we account for the evil in the world, the disease and the suffering, the ignorance and the limitations of the human condition? The answer is, of course, complicated. But one approach is to look at the health and purity of the vestures to which the spirit of any given man is immersed. We can have a healthy body, generally speaking, but if one of our legs are broken, we cannot walk. We may be of sound mind, but if we are deaf, we cannot hear, or if our eyes are damaged, we cannot see. The vesture is injured and cannot function in its intended manner. Analogously, our internal vestures, which may be in an, uh, in an unhealthy state, are in need of repair and purification. They need to be restored to their natural healthy state. They can be clogged or blocked or broken like a mirror that is covered in mud, which cannot reflect the light of the sun that shines upon it. It is probably wise to assume that if all our internal vestures were in perfect order, we would be enlightened at some very high level. We would be in bliss consciousness 24 seven. We would have achieved an unbreakable equal mindedness that nothing could disturb. Anything short of that means health somewhere needs to be restored. The voice of the silence, the light from the one master, the one unfading golden light of spirit shoots its effulgent beams on the disciple from the very first. Its rays thread through the thick, dark clouds of matter. Now here, now there, these rays illuminate like sun sparks light the earth through the thick foliage of the jungle growth. But, O oh disciple, unless the flesh is passive, head cool, the soul as firm and pure as flaming diamond, the radiance will not reach the chamber. Its sunlight will not warm the heart. Nor will the mystic sounds of the Akashic Heights reach the year, however eager, at the initial stage. The reference to the dark clouds of matter represents organs and vestures currently incapable of transmitting the light that comes from above, the life stream winding its way through all the planes of matter. Theosophical therapeutics is the science and the art of the purification of the vestures. Divine wisdom is needed to untie the knots that restrict the expression of soul. There is a spiritual science and a perennial philosophy dedicated to the liberation of all that is good and beautiful within the soul of man. When we look at the history of mysticism, which is the study of those who've had, you might say, ecstatic experiences, uh, enlightened experiences, uh, scholars often divide the field into two distinct sections, 
called the Via Positiva and the Via Negativa, the positive path and the negative path. The Via Positiva is marked by embracing the beauty of nature, the development of the virtues, the oneness of life, uh, meditation on what is divine, universal good, the agathon, the love of the Christ spirit, the compassion of the Buddha nature. On the other hand, the Via Negativa is characterized by the negation of what is illusory, what is temporal, what is divisive. It is a process of disidentification from name and form. It is the neti neti meditation. I am not my body, not my name, not my job, not my projects, not my roles in life, not my family, not my country, not my likes and dislikes, not the language I use, not my personal history, not my possessions, not my standing in society or my reputation. This process of stripping away a false sense of self is necessary to experience, at least in part, a place within ourselves that exists outside of space and time. It is an, it is an attempt to adopt the mental posture of the immortal soul, which has seen countless lives, had countless bodies, countless names, and therefore should not identify with any particular one of them. Of course, this does not mean that we don't care about our roles and our families and our projects. It just means withdrawing any false attachments from them. The via negativa focuses upon the removal of vices, blockages, and obstacles. Think of the Ganesha uh, symbol, that re the removal of obstacles in the Hindu tradition. It is about sanding down the rough edges of our personalities and self-study from the standpoint of the soul that stands behind and beyond the personal nature. It is overcoming self-centeredness. The mystical path of the Via Negativa lends itself to the concept of healing and health very elegantly. Our natural condition is health, but when something interrupts it, there is disease and reduction in functionality. It would be nice, at least from the standpoint of the lower man, if the spiritual path was a walk in the park and the smelling of roses, but it is not. We have enormous pasts, we, each one of us, over thousands of lifetimes, we have set in motion karmic causes that are followed by karmic effects, and there is no, no skirting them. If we have impressed the elementals of nature with energies that are not in concert with the grand cosmic plan of universal self-realization, and we set them, we have to set them right. We have to restore the health of those elementals. They need a new charge and succession, as Whitman would say. Like Raja Yoga, which combines together Yana, Karma, and Bhakti Yogas, in, in Theosophia, divine wisdom combines together both the via positiva and the via negativa into a synthetic whole. Yana yoga is the purification of our thoughts and ideas from one point of view. Karma yoga is the purifications of our actions from another. And bhakti yoga is the purification of our motives, perhaps. In addition to the idea of metaphysical health, which is the healing of the elementals, we might postulate on other types of health. Philosophical health might be measured in the quality and intensity of the questions we are asking, or loyalty to the truth, and our willingness to establish an open and receptive mind. Psychological health could be measured by the degree of honesty, amount of humility, the open textured nature of the sense of self, and internal resilience to challenges. Devotional health could be measured in the capacity to stay true to a vow, willingness to sacrifice, and ever-increasing gratitude for life's lessons and blessings. Ethical health could be measured in the degree of altruism one can generate, and in the purity of motive. Moral health could be seen in the capacity to serve, and the clarity of comprehension of one's svadharman, 
the unique self-appointed duty. All of these qualities of our internal vestures are continuums. If the Atman, the true self, can be defined as infinite potential, as suggested in the secret doctrine, then there is no top end or bottom end to this spectrum. The process of evolution is cyclic, and the power and the might of the Atman is unfathomable. If we use the analogy of physical health, we can better understand our condition on inner planes. Just as the human body is an ecosystem of interconnected organs, muscle, bone, and tissue, even so we can assume that each of the more etheric levels above and beyond the body namely the astral, the pranic, and the comic, are themselves equally complex ecosystems of classes of elementals. Knots and blockages might be found in any of these levels by the trained adept. And many great teachers of the esoteric tradition were healers like Mesmer and Paracelsus. Much of the teachings concerning adjustments at these levels are hidden and esoteric and would prove dangerous to those dabbling in these areas. The transmission of many of these teachings are reserved for those who have undertaken a training and a uh, have qualified for initiation. This is a task of immense self-discipline and self-control. But sacred texts from so many traditions encourage the neophyte to begin on the plane of the mind where self-control, self-reliance, and self-mastery must be one. If we change, if change rather, is not successful at this level, all conditions will return, will return to, their, to their previous state due to the cyclic return of impressions, spoken of by William Kwan Judge. To secure the change, the mind must be changed. Our thoughts direct our desires. Our desires stimulate planes of energy, which in turn coagulate those into astral forms, which form the model of our physical constitution. So the mind is the king, but can also be the jester. The Buddha said, From the Dhammapada, all that we are is the result of what we have thought. All that we are is founded on our thoughts and formed of our thoughts. If a man speaks or acts with an evil thought, pain pursues him as the wheel of the wagon follows the hoof of the ox that draws it. All that we are is the result of what we have thought. All that we are is founded on our thoughts and formed of our thoughts. If a man speaks or acts with a pure thought, happiness pursues him like his own shadow that never leaves him. Buddha. The purification and, cl and clarification of the mind is an essential ingredient in the healing of our vestures because the mind is causal to all the lower vestures. In the effort to master the mind, the Bhagavad Gita records this dialogue between Arjuna and Krishna. From the Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna says, O Krishna, the mind is full of agitation, turbulent, strong, and obstinate. I believe the restraint of it to be as difficult as that of the wind. Krishna replies, Without doubt, O thou of mighty arms, the mind is restless and hard to restrain. But it may be restrained, O son of Kunti, by constant practice and the development of dispassion. Yes, the mastery of the mind is difficult. But then again, so many other things in life are difficult, like learning a new language, learning to play piano, mastering geometry, or raising children. In all cases, and particularly in the mastery of the mind, practice makes perfect. 
More and more, we need to direct the mind, select our thoughts, observe our responses, and become more deliberate and more intentional, more wakeful, less drifting. We are given this sage advice from George William Russell, the Irish Theosophist. From George William Russell, A.E. What a man thinks that he is, that is the old secret. In this self-conception lies the secret of life, the way of escape and return. We have imagined ourselves into littleness, darkness, and feebleness. We must imagine ourselves into greatness, the renewal of youth. Our conception of ourselves, our insight into how the world works, our awareness of the laws of the spirit that Dr. Rich talked about, all create an atmosphere within which we mentally and morally breathe. That atmosphere can be expanded, purified, and directed. It is something to be able to paint a particular picture or to carve a statue and so to make a few objects beautiful. But it is far more glorious to carve and paint the very atmosphere and medium through which we look, which morally we can do. To affect the quality of the day, that is the highest of arts. Henry David Thoreau from Walden. The effort to acquire spiritual wisdom, to climb the mountain and to purify one's vestures, to heal them is the old path. Krishna reminds us that there is no purifier of vestures like spiritual knowledge. It is the medicine of the soul. From the Bhagavad Gita. Even if thou wert the greatest of all sinners, thou shalt be able to cross over all sins in the bark of spiritual knowledge. As a natural fire, O Arjuna, reduceth fuel to ashes, so does the fire of knowledge reduce all actions to ashes. There is no purifier in this world to be compared to spiritual knowledge. And he who is perfected in devotion findeth spiritual knowledge springing up spontaneously in himself in the progress of time. Chapter 4. This royal knowledge, this royal secret is the greatest purifier. Righteous and imperishable, it is a joy to practice and can be directly experienced. But those who have no faith in the supreme law of life do not find me, Arjuna. They return to the world passing from death to death. Chapter 9. Deeds of sacrifice, of mortification and of charity are not to be abandoned. For they are proper to be performed and are the purifiers of the wise, chapter 18. There is an alchemical power in the pursuit of spiritual wisdom. There is the fire of tapas, the flame of spiritual striving that burns out all impurities. It provides the foundational activity for the healing of all the vestures, we are told. Life proceeds from within without, as proclaimed in the secret doctrine. The acquisition of spiritual wisdom is a uniting of the higher mind and heart with the lower mind and vestures. We must plant the seed deep into the heart and nurture it. Spiritual wisdom is gained incrementally, little by little, step by step. This is how nature works. Each increment of spiritual knowledge sets forth a cascade of purification to the vestures below. 
And what is spiritual wisdom if it is not awareness of the self, the self of all creatures? So it is clear that this is the long path with no shortcuts, which is why there is so much dignity in living this way. Is this not how the great sequoias grow, the oaks and banyan trees of the earth, little by little? We take heart that the knowledge of the soul is intact. The master is within and the transformation is with the vestures, which are not the self, but rather the tools of the self. Behind and beyond the great sacred texts like the Bhagavad Gita and the Voice of the Silence lies an immense intelligence, an oceanic heart. It is the Logos in the cosmos, which speaks through all the teachers and text to any and all receptive aspirants. We are too much in the world, too caught up in its illusory and temporal travails. Yes, it is our duty to be in the world and to be of aid, but if we have any hope of being of use in the amelioration and suspension of suffering of what ails our fellow man, we ourselves must take up residence on more permanent grounds. We are, each one of us, building an inner life. We are growing the garden of immortality within. If we can establish a beachhead of identity beyond the world, beyond all personal concerns, then we are in a much stronger position to heal the vestures of, of, of our nature. Thank you very much.